Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Allie Webb. I'm a field marketing specialist for Axonics Therapy and will be moderating this webinar. This evening, Dr. Kemper will be speaking about bladder and bowel dysfunction, the common symptoms, patients experience, and treatment options that may help you regain bladder and bowel control. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Kemper. Hi, all. Thanks so much for having me, and thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Allie. Um, so I'm, Doc, I'm Michael Kemper. I'm a urologist. I work for Georgia Urology, uh, primarily in the Decatur, uh, Conyers, and Hillendale offices. I specialize primarily in uh, lifestyle urologist quality of life procedures, so male and female incontinence, voiding dysfunction, men's health. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about bladder control primarily. Um, here's some safety information about uh, axonics in general. Mostly this is just uh, to talk about how we're going to be treating um, overactive bladder and bladder control with this. Um, so bladder and bowel symptoms can definitely disrupt your life. You know, people make changes. They need to know where all the bathrooms are every time they want to go out. Uh, they need to drink less before they're going to go to bed, drink less before they're making a trip on the car, have to get up in the middle of the movie. Um, this is a common problem for just about everybody to some degree and for lots of people more than others. It's a common condition. It affects almost 50 million people in the United States and another 20 million people have trouble with bowel control. And only half of those people who have really severe symptoms ever even know that there is treatment. So that's the first step today that y'all are taking in terms of learning about there being treatments. Understanding your condition. So what is overactive bladder? So overactive bladder, that sudden urge to urinate and inability to control it. Urinary retention, so difficulty peeing, difficulty emptying the bladder or involuntary loss of stool, which is fecal incontinence. So normal bladder function, throughout the day, your kidneys make urine, it fills the bladder. And that depends on how many, much fluids you are, if you're on a diuretic, if um, a lot of different things. There are nerve signals that go to the brain, from the bladder to the brain that's saying, hey, how full am I? And nerve signals that the brain sends that lets you know when it's time to urinate. Um, and then in order to urinate, the nerves go to the bladder, contract the bladder, and at the same time, relax the urethra and relax the pelvic floor muscles. So overactive bladder is that frequent and urgent need to empty your bladder. And it can oftentimes be that sort of run into the bathroom and not quite making it in time. So urinary frequency going more than eight times a day, urinary urgency, where you really have to get there right away when you have to pee. Um, urge incontinence, that not quite making it there in time. And that nocturia waking up at two or more times in the middle of the night to have to go to the bathroom. Um, and I'll add on, there's sometimes folks that will wake up and they're already wet. Um, so what happens with that? Sometimes, frequently, it's an abnormal communication between the brain and the bladder. And so the bladder either is sending you to go to the, re the, the restroom either when it's not all that full and it's contracting, or it's not giving you those I'm slightly full signals, and instead you're just getting the it's an emergency signals. Um, urinary incontinence, there's a few different things that cause urinary incontinence, or a few different ways we describe it. So, and a lot of people have both, uh, particularly women who've had children will frequently have both. Um, so stress incontinence is that leakage when you cough or sneeze or stand up. And that's usually caused by weakness of the pelvic floor muscles. And we're going to talk to that about that a little bit later. And then there's that urge incontinence that we just talked about. And if you have both, it's mixed urinary incontinence. All of this can um, impact your quality of life. So it may cause you not to reach out as much in physical activities, may have you not go on trips that you wanted to go to, may feel uh, guilty about interrupting things may feel like leaking and needing to wear pads cause you to lose some self-respect or fearing that you're going to have issues, um, fearing that you're smelling like urine all the time, uh, needing to wear pads, needing to go through pads, which are not cheap, needing to have bedding that has to affect that, not being able to work even. Um, it is not normal. This is not something that just everybody has to deal with as they get older. It's not just part of being a woman. Men can have this too. Um, it's not just something you have to deal with. It's not just a prostate issue um, or not always just a prostate issue in men. Uh, and it's not caused by anything that you did. So there are treatments to help regain the control of your bladder and bowel, and we're gonna talk about a few of them. So the initial treatment for someone who comes into my office and they're saying, hey, I'm going to the bathroom all the time, 
is we usually start with some bladder training exercises. So there are some urge suppression techniques, those pelvic floor muscle exercises, timed voiding, where you say, hey, I'm gonna to go to the bathroom on this exact time, um, pelvic floor exercises that you can do or rehab that can be done with that. Um, there are lifestyle changes, caffeine, carbonated beverages, alcohol, spicy foods. Those can all cause people to have to run to the bathroom a little bit more often. The other first line therapy is medicines. Uh, there are two main classes, the anticholinergics and the beta agonists, and they work okay for a lot of people. Uh, most of the time, you'll be tried with one or both of those, and we'll see how they work. For plenty of people, that doesn't work well enough, and we need to move on to more advanced therapies, of which there are three. The first is percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, which is where they stimulate the nerve that, so the nerves that go to the bladder also are the same nerve roots that are in the, the heel. And so you can treat those by hitting them with a uh, electrical stimulation. Uh, it, it takes a little while, about five to six sessions to see an improvement. And it's a significant time commitment, 12 weekly sessions. It does work for some patients. Uh, Botox, so Botox is uh, Botox similar to injecting it into your smile lines and frown lines to relax the skin and the muscle. You can inject it into the bladder to relax the muscle of the bladder. Um, it does work for a lot of folks. Uh, the downsides to it, it needs to be done um, every about six months and about one in 20 people will have a little bit of trouble peeing afterwards uh, and not be able to pee at all, um, which you just have to wait for it to wear off. And then finally, there's sacral neuromodulation therapy. So this is where similar to how I said that nerve root was, is runs to the back of the heel and runs to the bladder, this, this one, we just hit it directly with a stimulator that helps to kind of filter out all of those bad impulses and make it so that um, you don't have the same kind of urgency and frequency. So that's exonics therapy as a sacral neuromodulation therapy. And it's a treatment that has basically three indications. Uh, and we're going to talk primarily about two of them, although the fecal incontinence is also necessary. So overactive bladder, which we've talked about, urinary obstructive urinary retention if it's not caused by a uh, blockage like the prostate or the uh, or a scar tissue and then uh, fecal incontinence that leakage of stool um, so how does it work uh, so it's basically there's that abnormal communication between the brain and the bladder and the bowel and so it provides that gentle stimulation to those nerves and that helps to restore that normal communication between the brain and the bladder and the bowel which can result in improvement in the symptoms um, so the first thing that we do for folks that, so when someone comes into my office, they've tried the behavioral therapy, they've tried the, um, the, uh, medicines when those don't work, we take a look inside the bladder, a procedure called a cystoscopy, and we do some nerve tests of the bladder, something that's called a urodynamic study. And if everything looks right, then the next step would be a trial period of the sacral neuromodulation of the axonics therapy. The way that works is in our offices um, or in our surgery centers, we put in a temporary device that goes inside the back and then it's just taped up to the skin for two or three days uh, and gives you a chance to sort of try before you buy and see if this is a therapy that's gonna work for you. And I'll say that better than 90% of the time in my experience, it ends up being something that has worked really well for people during that trial period. And most people end up going on to the full implant. Um, there are a couple of options for a full implant. So the full implant is essentially that same lead that we put in, just a permanent version, and then a battery. And there's two different batteries. One of them is rechargeable. Uh, it lasts, and I apologize for that, um, it lasts a little longer, about 15 years. You need to recharge it about once a month for about an hour. The other option, the F15, is a recharge-free device. So that's something that goes in, can last 10 to 20 years. Um, and it's a little bit of a bigger uh, opening that we have to, to use to put it in, but it doesn't need to be recharged. Uh, it's miniaturized, so it's a smaller thing. Safely, this is the rechargeable, delivers therapy with that miniaturized rechargeable implant um, through a really minimally invasive, doesn't need a, um, a inpatient stay. The opening is about maybe the size of your uh, half your pinky finger. Um, this is unlike some previous implants. Thankfully, this is one that doesn't need to get removed if you're gonna get an MRI um, in certain conditions. 
and you can get full body scans with certain MRIs. So it's not something that's going to get broken by an MRI most of the time. Uh, the way that it works is there's a little pocket size remote control. You can put it on your keychain if you'd like, um, that just lets you increase and decrease the device whenever you want to uh, and puts that in control in your hands. Uh, this is for the rechargeable one. It's just a little belt that you wear over that area. And in about 60 minutes, once a month, it charges it back up to full. Charging uh, is relatively easy. Most of my patients, I would say about half of them have the chargeable device, have the rechargeable, half of them have the non-rechargeable. They both are very happy with it. Um, and it's just, this is something that it's easy, yes. Most importantly than how easy it is to use is how much does it work? And 93% of patients have clinically significant improvements at two years. And usually it starts working basically immediately. You know, people have, that's how we know that that three-day trial is enough. And there's lots of options to fine tune it and get it working better as you continue to use it. Over 90% of patients were satisfied with their results, significantly higher than um, the same folks on medicines, which don't work as well for a lot of people. 94% um, satisfied, 93% would do it again. Um, you know, it can bring people back to more of a normal life where you don't have to worry as much about what you're doing every day and about how, how where, where the bathroom is every time you want to go out. We're going to transition uh, from here over to uh, stress urinary incontinence a little bit, which is another thing that a lot of folks will get. This is that leakage when you cough or sneeze um, or exercise or work out or stand up. Um, so again, we sort of ran over that storage of urine, bladder relaxes, urethra contracts while you're storing. And then when you're emptying, the urethra has to relax appropriately. And so on folks with stress urinary incontinence, it's not so much that the signal is wrong, it's that the urethra can't provide enough closing pressure to hold back the body. And whenever you cough, you raise the pressure in your belly, which raises the pressure in the bladder and causes it to, um, uh, to leak, to overwhelm that pressure. This is extremely common. It's, a, it's very common in women who've had children. It's common in women who haven't had children as well. Not alone. One in three women at some point in their lives. And it's also something that can affect men uh, after prostate cancer treatment, not infrequently. And this is something that for a lot of women impacts their quality of life in much the same way that that overactive bladder does. Um, so the pads is the same problem, needing to that smell of urine at times the money on the, the having to get the pads. There are treatments that we can do that can help that. So uh, there are basically three things that can be done. This is usually a uh, that pressure problem. So the first thing is you can do pelvic floor exercise. You can strengthen up those muscles. And that works well. Uh, it works better for folks that are younger, honestly. Um, but it might be something that is a good first try. If that doesn't work, then there are other options, uh, urethral bulking and a surgical sling, which we'll talk about. So the uh, initial management, those lifestyle changes, uh, lower weight is going to make that pressure in your belly a little bit lower. Um, smoking is one that can weaken all those muscles. Chronic cough, yeah. Um, pelvic floor exercises, similar to the ones for the overactive bladder, can help with the Kegel exercises. Um, and you can also do pelvic floor physical therapy as well. Um, next, there's the sling. So a surgical sling is a piece of mesh that goes around the urethra. And so it basically gives, it help, gives those muscles a helping hand. It, it helps to increase that closing pressure. 80 to 90% success. It's the gold standard by many folks. Um, it doesn't, it's not a great idea to do if you're still planning on having more children because it can weaken it. Um, and it does have a certain amount of downtime. It needs, it usually needs to have folks be put to sleep for, um, and uh, a period of time of recovery it does involve an incision in the vaginal area, uh, cut. Um, the other options are urethral bulking agents. These are medicines that are injected into the urethra in an office setting um, that uh, is, does not have as much downtime, is a little easier on the body. Um, and so that is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Bulkamid, which is one of those bulking agents.
Um, so what is it? It's a uh, alternative that is a soft water-based gel that is, um, improves that stress incontinence. So this is a little video we're gonna play for you. Volcamid can help provide the relief you've been longing for. The short incision-free procedure typically takes less than 10 minutes, involves three to four small injections of soft water-based gel into the wall of the urethra to help prevent urine from leaking out of the bladder during day-to-day -day activities. It's safe, quick, and most patients can get back to your normal activities almost immediately. So how does it work? It's those cushions of that, uh, it's sort of hydrogel, it's a water-based gel that basically block off the urethra a little bit. And that helps to prevent that, um, those leakages. Safe and effective, 92% improvement uh, of people have improvement uh, or cure. Uh, takes 10 to 15 minutes in outpatient uh, under just local anesthesia and can last for a long period of time for a lot of women. So we ready for symptom, symptom relief. Uh, so that is talking to schedule a consultation with us or with a, another urologist, uh, trial the therapy. Let us see if this is something that might work for you. All right, this is gonna transition us over into the Q&A. So I think that um, Allie is gonna have some questions for me. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kemper. It was a pleasure hearing from you. Okay, are these procedures covered under Medicare? So they are, um, these procedures, both of these procedures should be covered under Medicare. It says, I have two prostate spots showing up on an MRI. Can you perform a fusion biopsy? Uh, we can, um, if that's something that's needed. Yes, we definitely can. Okay, and will it help men as well? It definitely will. I have a lot of men. So in men, it's a little bit of a different situation sometimes because the first thing that it can be causing the problem is the prostate uh, and prostate blockage. And so for um, axonics therapy, initially, we usually will treat that obstruction with a uh, procedure. And we have minimally invasive procedures for that or medicines. If that isn't working um, or doesn't work, there's some bladder effects, then we move on to overactive bladder treatments like medicines and then uh, exonics, which I have men that have had that have done very well with. Okay. It looks like we have a current patient and he wants to know if he should consider consulting with you or his current doctor. Uh, his issue is frequent late night bathroom runs and leakage. Uh, he's on Tim Muller. Yep. And Go ahead and talk to your, uh, your current doctor. Um, this is, yeah, if you're running to the bathroom in the middle of the night, if you're leaking, you're already on two meds for the prostate, definitely uh, think about going in because we that's something we can get better. And, you know, if you tell folks, hey, I'm still having issues, then yeah. And why is it that I only get leaking at certain times a month? It's not a regular problem, but one that is starting to cause problems. Well, um, I have definitely had folks who have issues more, um, you know, if you get a respiratory infection, you'll have more leaking. Um, if you are one thing that may be part of it. So some, I have some folks during cold and flu season that will tend to get a little bit more of those urinary symptoms, um, because some of those will have similar effects. They can have anticholinergic effects. They can have bladder effects, um, to it. Uh, and so when you're taking those kind of over-the-counter medicines that can affect, so it's all of an interaction. It's also maybe foods or other things. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Okay. And can you chat a little more about bladder training? I guess just a quick question about bladder training. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> bladder training is, um, so that is the idea of, having to go to the bathroom, trying to delay it for a period of time, training your bladder up to fill, to fill up a little bit better. Um, and from that, uh, to see a, um, whether or not, uh, you can sort of stretch things out, have to go to the bathroom a little less often. Okay. And how do we schedule an appointment to see if I'm a candidate? Um, so you just call in, I got the number on the bottom of the screen, um, and we can set, get an, an appointment to see you. A few people, um, are patients of, if you are a, 
And if you are a current patient of George Urology, see your doctor, talk mm -hmm. to them about it. The part of the way that we work is if they don't do it, they will get you to somebody who does. Mm -hmm. And we have plenty of people in every pod of George Urology that do a um, excellent job of offering this therapy to patients. Uh, and so all you got to do is bring it up to your provider. Okay, we got a few more good ones. Okay, should I wait for a certain period of time after prostate removal to see if things go back to normal? So your leakage after prostate, can after prostate cancer and prostate removal will continue to get better for the first year after surgery. And so doing those Kegel exercises, working on that, and they will, it, I would expect it to get better over that time. Um, the, it should be better at three months than it was at uh, right after surgery. It should be better at six months than three months. About the only time I'll do something before a year is in folks who have seen basically no improvement from three months to six months or from six months to nine months. And they're really doing three, four, five, six pads a day. Um, and so in those folks, you know, there's sling, there's artificial urinary sphincter, or we've been starting to use Bulkamid more in select patients to see if that will help. Um, what type of support do I have once I have the implant? So the main reason why I use Axonix, honestly, is that the support from the representatives is extremely good in terms of if you have an implant in, they will be there to support you and make sure that it's working right for you. And that includes coming in to see me. That includes seeing uh, the folks that work with you every step of the way as you get the trial period. There's someone who's working, who's holding your hand and talking you through it. After the device is in, there's somebody who's telling you how to increase and decrease it and what to do with it. So they really help a lot with that. Can you just um, kind of let them know uh, kind of the age range? I have some patients asking about uh, some older candidates in their 90s and would they be a candidate? Uh, potentially. Um, it would depend. It depends a lot on what else is going on. So uh, they are, uh, if it, it's a healthy 90, very possibly. It's, you know, the, the implant itself usually requires, um, uh, a gen uh, can require sort of mild anesthesia. Um, but it's definitely something that you, uh, that a lot of folks are candidates, even if they're older. Okay. And you mentioned exercise to control urination urgency. Can exercise help men with BPH? It can, but not as much. Um, so it can, as long as the BPH is being treated, either with medicines or with um, surgical procedure, and there's no longer an obstruction. Because uh, a lot of the times the issue for men with BPH is more that there is an increased voiding pressure and even trying to relax things consciously uh, can still not quite be working well enough. And how long should you take medication before trying another treatment option? I will trial medications for one month. Um, so usually just taking it a week and it's not working isn't a good enough trial, but continuing for more than about four to six weeks is, four to six weeks is a good trial. And if it's not working well enough, so generally, that first medicine, if the first medicine doesn't work well, I add on another medicine in the other class. So like we said, there's the beta agonists and then there's the overactive bladder, the anticholinergics. And then if those two together aren't working well, I usually it's not, there's not a lot of gain in shuffling through the other meds. At that point, folks tend to do the best uh, with doing um, another treatment, an advanced treatment. We may have kind of touched on this, but um, why do some nights I'm up every two hours and other nights I only wake up with urge once? When what the last time you had something to drink, um, you know, if you've had any bladder irritants with dinner, um, if you, uh, you know, cold and flu medicine, uh, there's lots of different things uh, that can cause, you know, sometimes uh, people have different, different day to day, and it's more on the averages. If it's bothersome enough to you on the nights that it is, and that happens often enough, it's still worth treating. Uh, so that brings us to the end of this evening's webinar, Dr. Kemper. 
Thank you so much for your time. We hope this presentation was beneficial. Uh, if you would like to, for more information or to schedule an appointment, please call Dr. Kemper's office. The number is on the screen. And he does also offer self-scheduling online uh, via his website. Uh, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy your evening. Thank you guys so much for giving us some of your time and hopefully we can help you and hopefully it helped you.